We're finishing uh, chapter 4 in 1 Thessalonians this morning. Um, we've been uh, preaching through this, uh, one of the first letters that Paul wrote to, uh, um, to any church. And um, we've called the series Living in the Last Days uh, because so many references to uh, the return of Christ and uh, the culmination of uh, uh, history as we know it. And, uh, and uh, um, today... I have a message for you with a title called Grief in Belief. Grief in Belief. And uh, so follow along with me as we read um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 13. We're going to read down through verse 18. He says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who've fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then he says, therefore comfort one another with these words. This is the word of God. Let's bow our heads together for a time of prayer. Father, we do bow before you again this morning, and Lord, we're grateful for this word of truth, and Lord, just for the hope that it gives us, and um, God, we pray today that uh, you would reveal your truth to us, God, each one of us, as we uh, delve into uh, to this passage of scripture, and God, just to uh, uh, fill me with your spirit and your power, God, that we might deliver that truth in a way that um, is, it pleases you and brings others to know you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I heard this uh, um, uh, about a coal miner in northeastern Pennsylvania, and uh, <clears throat> his job was sort of a, a unique job, one that I hadn't really thought about, but this particular coal miner, his job was to go down into the mines every morning before all the rest of the miners went down to um, check for uh, gas, methane gas and other dangerous gases down into the mine. So every morning he would descend down into the mine with a safety light and, and uh, an instrument to check for dangerous gases. And um, if the light on the, the uh, device flickered the right way, of course, he would run for his life to get out of there as quickly as he, as he could, but, but most mornings, uh, obviously, after checking the mine, he would come back up to the surface, and uh, when he got back to the surface, all the miners that would be working in the mine that day would be standing around, and, and he would make an announcement to them. He'd say, okay, it's, it's safe. You can go down into the mine. Well, I want to explain to you this morning that that's very similar to what Christ has done for us with death. Jesus went down into death and returned to let us all know that it's okay to go in. It's okay to enter death. You, you can enter death in the darkness and the unknown. Uh, Jesus essentially says, you know, I've been there and now it's safe. I want you to know it's safe for you to die. I've been there and I've checked it out. And there, there's not any victory over me. I've overcome death. And if you are with me in death, uh, uh, then uh, I'll be with you in, in life. And so uh, essentially that's, uh, that's what uh, is taking place. And, and uh, in our text today, I think we get some of that revelation. You know, Jesus makes a difference in grief and death. You know, um, Grief is difficult for everyone, and uh, probably everyone here at some point has lost someone close to them. 
And uh, you know what it's like to grieve for a loved one who's, who's passed on from this life. And, you know, when our loved ones close their eyes in death, it, it just seems to hurt, doesn't it? It's, uh, it's hard to deal with. And, and uh, you know, we think about in Scripture, even Jesus wept. The Bible says in John eleven thirty five when his friend Lazarus died. And Jesus knew in just a few minutes he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But John eleven thirty five, 35, the shortest verse in the Bible says Jesus wept. And so there was some sorrow there uh, for Jesus uh, because of the death of Lazarus. And maybe it was, it was because of uh, the grief that uh, all of Lazarus' friends and family were experiencing. But, you know, there, there's a lot of unknowns when it comes to death and grief. And the early church, uh, you know, the Christians there in Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonica and everywhere else, they didn't have a, a complete revelation of uh, yet on resurrection. And, and I don't even know that we have a complete revelation on a lot of this stuff yet, obviously. Uh, but, uh, you know, little by little, God opened up the doors through Scripture. And, you know, this is, like I said, this is one of the first letters that Paul wrote. So, they, they hadn't had the opportunity to read circulated letters, the, you know, explaining a lot of theology yet, just what Paul had told them. The Gospels hadn't been penned yet, so the Gospels weren't being circulated around. <clears throat> but Paul had taught them, obviously, that Jesus would return at any point. He had taught them about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and a lot about his life and, you know, essentially orally teaching the Gospel and, he pointed to Christ as Messiah and those Old Testament passages and things like that. So they believed that Jesus would return at any moment. And that's something we should believe. Jesus could come back at any time. There's nothing that happens that needs to happen. But, but so apparently they were concerned what might happen to their loved ones who had already died. Because uh, Paul had taught them that Jesus was going to come back and for believers, they, he was going to take them with him and uh, for all those that were left. So, you know, they didn't have a, a, any theology on, well, what happened to their loved ones who had already died and were buried? And so they were probably worried a little bit. And so in verse 13, Paul wrote that, that he, he didn't want them to be ignorant you know, uh, about what happened to those who had fallen asleep. And so he didn't want to be ignorant about that. He, he used the term fallen asleep. That was a common way in the early church for early Christians to refer to those who had died. And, and uh, we don't really necessarily use it that much today, but it was very common in their days. And we see even a reference to it, like I've already mentioned the, the story of Lazarus. We see a reference to it in, in John chapter 11 in the death of Lazarus. And we look at that story um, Jesus even said it. We see he, uh, he says, oh, our friend Lazarus sleeps. He's, he's talking to his disciples about having to go see Lazarus and, and uh, his family. He said, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And the disciples said, Lord, well, if he sleeps, then that's good. You know, if he's sick, then that'll help him heal. He'll, he'll, get, he'll get well. And and uh, it says in verse 13, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was talking about rest and sleep. And then Jesus finally plainly had to tell them, Lazarus is dead. And so we kind of see uh, the use of, of the word sleep, even by Jesus, to refer to someone who had died. And, and um, so here Paul wrote about those who've fallen asleep, and he, he means those Christians who have died. And uh, notice the last line of verse 13. I want you to pay attention to that. Uh, he says, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. He didn't want them to be ignorant about what had happened to, the, their, to their loved ones who had died so they didn't grieve like people who had no hope. And that's the key of what I want to talk to you about this morning is, you know, Paul's basically saying there's no reason for you to grieve like the, like the world. Many of the Gentiles of their day, just like probably a lot of people outside the church today, they didn't even believe in the afterlife. Um, you know, they, they, and most of them adamantly would deny bodily resurrection, and so they didn't have any hope for any meaningful and lasting reunion 
with friends or family members who had died. So naturally, those apart from Christ would grieve quite differently than those who have faith in Christ. And so this is what he's getting at. And, and that's why I've titled our message today, Grief in Belief. Because when you have a belief and faith in Jesus, the way you grieve is very different than the way those who don't have any hope in the world grieve. And so, um, grief is different for those who believe. So, the main idea of the message today is simply this. In faith, you have a hope that can help you in your grief. In faith, faith in Jesus, you have a hope that can help you in your grief. And and so I want to share three ways that grief is different for those who have faith in Jesus. And so that's basically uh, what we're going to share with you this morning from this text. And, and uh, uh, it's pretty simple. I think you can definitely see it in the te- these things in the text. And the first one is this. I want you to understand that grief is different for those who have faith in Jesus because believers have the hope of future resurrection. There's a hope for future resurrection. We've, we've already mentioned that, but, but look in verse 14. He's, look what he says. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So notice the condition Paul places on the hope, of Christ, the hope Christians have here. He says, if you believe, if you believe that Jesus died and was raised, then you can also believe that God will raise your loved ones. And so... Uh, the first thing he says is you got to believe Jesus died. You know, there's some people in our world today, they don't, they don't even believe Jesus died. Uh, people who follow Islam, they don't believe Jesus really died. Uh, but, but, you know, there were many de- uh, witnesses to the death of Jesus. Roman soldiers made sure he was dead. We read it in the gospel story by piercing his side with a sword. That was one of the ways they made sure that he was dead. And his body then was pre- prepared for burial. His body was laid in a borrowed tomb. Well, why do you lay a body in a tomb? I'll tell you why you lay a body in a tomb. You lay a body in a tomb because it's dead. That's why you do it. And so uh, the disciples and all of his followers, they mourned because he was dead. They hid because he was dead. Uh, Jesus died a sacrificial death of atonement as the Lamb of God on a cross at Golgotha. And I believe, you know, the Thessalonian church, those Christians, they believed this because of the testimonies of Paul and probably many other witnesses had circulated at that point in the whole world nearly that had, had, had any, uh, that part of the world anyway, had heard that Jesus died. And then they heard also that he had rose again. And so he says, not only must you believe Jesus died, but you must believe he rose from the dead. And, of course, the resurrection of Jesus proves that God was satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ. If Jesus, if Jesus claimed to be the Messiah and he lived his life claiming that he, he was from God and that he was the Lamb of God and he died on the cross and if God was, uh, did not, uh, um, was not satisfied that Jesus was the Messiah and all that was true, would God have raised him from the dead? No, God would not have raised him to the dead. Why would he raise somebody from the dead who claimed he was God in the flesh? The only reason that Jesus was raised from the dead, uh, uh, claiming that he was God in the flesh, was to prove that he was who he said he was. And that definitely proved that God was satisfied with Jesus, and it proved that Jesus destroyed death. He has power over death. His, His resurrection proves that he's God's Messiah and that he's our Savior. He predicted his death and resurrection and then it happened who who else did that nobody no one has done that only jesus and so remember what jesus told lazarus family i keep referring back to that story because it's a powerful uh the testimony of the resurrection but but when jesus was, was was with lazarus family in verse 25 he he told them he said i am the resurrection and the life and look what he says he says He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. 
<laughs> and so you got, you got to believe that because Jesus resurrected from the dead, he shows us that he has power over life and death. Not only can he raise himself, but he can raise you. And he can raise your loved ones. And so through his resurrection, Jesus took the, took the sting of death. Because of faith, because of belief in Jesus, you can experience a resurrection like Jesus. That's what he's telling us. And, and, uh, and so when you think about it from that perspective, it makes a death for Christian a lot like sleep. Uh, because it's, it's the sleep of the body. And, and there's a lot of, lot of theology here, and you can go a lot of places to try to describe a lot of this stuff, but... But basically, one of the things I think that we see here that's implied and understood is that when a Christian dies, the spirit of that Christian that will live eternally somewhere goes immediately into the presence of the Lord. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 8 that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we know that it's not the spirit that sleeps. The Spirit goes immediately into the presence of the Lord. Listen, folks, if you have faith in Jesus, when you close your eyes in death, you're going to open them in the presence of Jesus as far as your spirit is concerned, that eternal part of you, okay? And so, and we see that then the body awaits a day of resurrection. That's why Jesus brings those with him in verse 14 that we read uh, that uh, he brings those who sleep with him. He's bringing their spirits back to be reunited with their bodies that are buried. You see that in verse 14? He will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Their bodies are buried, but their spirits are with him. And when Jesus returns, he's bringing their spirits. And on that day, they'll get new bodies. Now, I don't know exactly how they get new bodies and some people worry about cremation and all this stuff, and you know, or, or when their bodies are lost at sea, or they're burned up in fires, or whatever, or scattered. You know, I mean, a lot of those things happen. Well, don't worry about it. God knows where every part of you is. First of all, and second of all, I don't think He needs everything to put you back into a glorified body better than the one you had to start with, because He creates from nothing. <laughs> and so he doesn't really need that, but we'll be seen and known as we're known, the Bible teaches us. So at this point, this is what happens. There's, there's this meeting, and we'll talk about some more in a second. I've kind of get ahead of myself. But, but uh, you get new glorified bodies that will live forever. Perfect bodies. So if you don't like the one you got now, if you know Jesus, just wait. You're going to get a better one. <sighs> But jumping down to verse 16, we see it here. He says in verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And this is what I want you to notice in verse 16 at this point. He says, The dead in Christ will rise first. You see that? It, it, those spirits who come back with him, their bodies will rise from the dead. There's a resurrection. The dead in Christ will rise first. So, so you see that? Believers have a hope in a future resurrection. So if you belong to Christ, you don't have to grieve like those people in the world because you and everyone you love who knows Jesus one day will experience a resurrection like his. In one of his lighter moments, Benjamin Franklin penned his own epitaph. He didn't profess to be a born-again Christian, but... He seems to be, have been influenced by Paul's teaching. He, he, was, he called himself a deist, and he, was, he came out of a pur the Puritan church. So, so <clears throat> I don't know exactly where his faith was, but here's what he wrote. He wrote, the body of B. Franklin, printer, like the cover of, of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding lies here. Food for worms. But the work shall not be wholly lost, for it will, as he believed, appear once more in a new and more perfect edition, corrected and amended by the author. <laughs> Interesting. Now, while there may be some questions about Franklin's faith, he obviously believed 
and a bodily resurrection for those who put their faith in God. He anticipated a day when he would receive a new body. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read about this. 1 Corinthians 15 is known as the great resurrection chapter. And uh, we could spend a lot of time there this morning uh, backing up a lot of what we're sharing. But, but look what it, uh, we, we read there. He says in verse 51, but I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So everybody's not going to die. When Jesus comes back, some people are going to be alive. And this is what he's referring to, exactly what Paul's writing in, uh, in our text for today. He says, but in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound... And the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will all be changed. You see that? <laughs> this is what he's referring to. The same thing Paul's talking about. And listen, if you put your faith in Jesus, and he's your Lord, you have a hope in a resurrection like his. So you don't have to grieve like those who have no hope. Believers have a hope in a future resurrection. Another reason... For this hope is this. That you don't have to grieve like those who have no hope. It's because believers have the promise of an imminent reunion. Because of the resurrection and the return of Christ, there's going to be a reunion, and it's an imminent reunion. And imminent basically just means that it could happen at any time. Imminent means it could happen now or now, anytime, right? That's what it means. And so, so this is what, what he's getting at. And, and so notice in verse 15, Paul appeals to the word of the Lord. He said, this we say by the word of the Lord. And I don't know for sure what he's referring to, what word of the Lord, but, but I speculate maybe he's thinking about John chapter 14, where Jesus is with his disciples. He's preparing them for his death. But, and he told them that he would return for those who are his. And in verse 3, he says, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus returns with all those who've already died, those whose spirits are with him. And, and Paul uses the first person here he, in, in our text. He says, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. And, and he shows that he believed in the imminent return of Christ. He, he knew that it could happen at any point, even in his lifetime. He must have believed that he would live to see it. And, and that's the way we have to live. We have to live as if we believe that Jesus could return at any time. Nothing has to take place uh, before Jesus returns. It could take place at any moment. And, and look what he says. He says, they will by no means precede those who are asleep. And what he means by this is that the rapture of the living will not prevent the resurrection of the bodies of those who've already died. You know, the, the Thessalonians, they were concerned about their friends and family who had already died. And he's saying, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, you're not gonna you're not, there, nothing's going to prevent them from their resurrection. And then he explains how it'll happen. And let's take a look at that in verse 16. He says, notice it'll be the Lord himself who descends from heaven, who returns. It's not going to be a likeness of him. It's not going to be just the spirit of the Lord. It'll be him. The Lord himself will descend. It, uh, the same Jesus that was born in Bethlehem, the same Jesus that was raised in Nazareth, the same Jesus that walked on the Sea of Galilee, the same Jesus that performed the miracles of healing and cast out demons, and the same Jesus that raised people from the dead, the same Jesus that died on the cross at Calvary, and the same Jesus that rose again. That's the Jesus that we'll see. He's going to come again. He's going to come down from heaven. That's what he says. He will descend from heaven. And notice there's going to be a shout. Jesus is going to shout. You know, what's he going to shout? Well, another speculation, I guess, but it reminds me of John eleven forty three in the story of Lazarus where Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! When he descends from heaven with a shout, it wouldn't surprise me if he says something, Bride, come forth! Or church, come forth. There's going to be a shout. Oh, man, what a shout. 
Oh, Lazarus. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, and I've heard people say this, and it's not one of my favorite speculations, but they say, if Jesus hadn't have said, Lazarus, come forth, and he just said, come forth, all the people would have come out of their grave. And maybe that's true. But Lazarus, when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, the Bible says, Lazarus walked out of the grave alive and bound with his grave clothes. And let me tell you, folks, when Jesus descends from heaven, there's going to be a shout of some kind, and all those who are his will come up out of their graves. What a day that'll be. Listen, it's going to happen, folks. And not only will there be a shout, but, the, but our text says in verse 16 that there will be a trumpet. And uh, he says, and with the trumpet of God. And the Jews were familiar with trumpets. They're called shofars, and, and uh, it's basically a ram's horn. And, and they used these shofars frequently, and so they were used to that sound of a shofar. And uh, the, the trumpet, that when they, when they uh, blew a ram's horn, and you're probably familiar with some of the stories, a lot of times they blew those ram's horns to declare war. And that's why they would blow them. They were going to war. And, and sometimes when they blew those horns, it declared uh, or announced a special event. Uh, there was some special event or some festival or holiday that they were celebrating or a season that was beginning. And other times, if you read in Scripture, when they blew that trumpet, it was a call for the entire nation of people to step forward and begin their journey to another place. <laughs> That's not a coincidence, folks, because when that trumpet of God sounds, there's a declaration for all three of these things. There's a declaration for a war that will end all wars. There's a declaration of a special day, and that's the day that Jesus returns for his bride. And there's also an announcement of a journey, and that journey's to go for all those who are his to be with him. Oh, that's what that trumpet sound will mean, folks. Uh, there's going to be uh, all three of those things. And, and then we read in verse 16 also that there, there's a voice of an archangel. Now, we don't know if it's Michael. Michael's the only archangel in the Bible that we know whose name, his name. But uh, there's more than one, so we don't know if it's him. But I've heard people say it was him. But the Bible just says there's going to be a voice of an archangel. And basically, you know, when we see, when we hear the voice of the archangel, this just reveals, <laughs> I don't know what the angel's going to say, but I believe that it just lets us know that uh, the host of the angels of God will witness the resurrection of God's church and they will share in the victory that belongs to Christ and his people. That's what is happening. And notice what he says, the dead in Christ then will rise first. So they were worried about their, their dead loved ones, but Paul basically says, don't worry about them. They're going to see Jesus before you do. They're going to get their new bodies before you do. And so he says, they're going to rise first. Where do they go? Look at the, in verse 17. He says, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in there. They're caught up. To the Lord in the air. That's where they go when they're resurrected. And then he says, and then we, all of us who are alive and remain, so if you don't die and Jesus returns, then you'll be caught up with them. So evidently, as soon as they get up there, I'm thinking everybody, who, all of the bride of Christ who's not seen death will also meet the Lord in the air. Now, there's a lot of folks who say that there's no rapture in the Bible. And some will teach that there's no rapture. And, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say about it except for right here, the Greek word means to be caught up, to be snatched away. And when they translated that Greek word into Latin, for the Latin translations of the Bible, they used the Latin word rapturo. And that word became the English word for rapture. And I don't know about you, but that's what I see here. <laughs> that's what I see. We're going to be caught up with him in the sky. 
Now, you can call it whatever you want to, but that's what it is. Right? That's what it is. The dead in Christ will taken up, be taken up to be with him. Then those who are alive in Christ will also be taken up with them to meet the Lord in the air. And what a day it'll be. We're going to see Jesus, and, 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 and there's going to be this reunion, you see. We got this reunion to look forward to. We'll be reunited with Jesus, first of all, and we'll be reunited with all our loved ones who belong to Christ who've already passed on. We got a, a, a promise of a reunion to look forward to, you know, and there's something special about reunions, and I don't know if y'all have family reunions, but but we have them, and and you know one thing one thing just point out about family reunions, everybody don't come. You know, a lot of people don't come, and it's going to be the same way up there. Unfortunately, everybody's not going to be there. But those that are there, oh, what a reunion it'll be! <laughs> oh man, just think about it. You know, I, I've tried to think of a way to explain what it would be like, and. The best thing I can think of, I've used this quite a few times, but it's not like this as much now. But when my children were little and I would travel, and I, if I hadn't seen them in a few days, not much more, gave, not much gave me more pleasure than, or joy when I'd get home and I'd hear them scream with elation, Daddy's home, Daddy's home. And they'd come and run and jump up in my arms, you know, and give me a hug, some kisses, welcoming and loving hugs and kisses of reunion. <laughs> That's an awesome feeling. Y'all, Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You've not seen somebody you love in a while. It's just an awesome feeling when you're reunited after being away for some time. And, you know, when Jesus returns and we're all caught up to greet him in the air, that's going to be a great reunion in the sky. You know, I don't know if we'll be able to take our eyes off of Jesus. But listen to me, there's no reason for us to grieve over the loss of a loved one if we're both believers in Christ because we can look forward to that day when we will see the one whom we've waited for for so long, of course Jesus, and we can see them with him. And uh, in him alone we have our hope. We can look for him. He's coming. So grief and belief means we don't have to grieve for our believing loved ones like those who have no hope because believers have the hope of future resurrection. And because of the future resurrection, believers have the promise of imminent reunion. <laughs> it could happen any time. That's one of the best things about it. And one more reason we don't have to grieve like those who have no hope is this. We don't have to grieve like those who have no hope because believers have the comfort of eternal relationship. Eternal relationship. Look in verse 17 with me. These last few words of verse 17. We're caught up to meet the Lord in there. Notice the last phrase. He says, thus we shall always be with the Lord. See that? <laughs> now I know 12 hour, 16 hour shifts can seem long. But they're not always. Always is a long time. Isn't it? You know, I, I heard one of the sportscasters talking about some record or something the other day on the radio program and and they said, that, that's a record that will never be broken. And I thought, never is a long time. You know, <laughs> always is a long time. Forever is a long time. They will forever be with the Lord. This meeting establishes an eternal relationship. You know, in this world, a lot of relationships are temporary. You know? People come in your life, people leave your life. And, and sometimes you never see them again. And sometimes it hurts. And um, sometimes you're glad they're gone, right? <laughs> That's just the facts, isn't it? But if you have a relationship with Christ, 
you have an eternal relationship with him and with all those who are his. <laughs> Listen, everybody, everyone who belongs to Jesus will be with Jesus from this point forever. You get it? An eternal relationship with him and with all those who are his. We will always be with the Lord forever. There will be no more sad goodbyes. Sad goodbyes are awful, aren't they? We hate them. They're not going to be anymore. They'll be over. There will be no more grief and no more sorrow because there will be no more death. Death is defeated. Death is a separator. But Christ is a uniter. He's a reuniter. He's a reconciler. And, and this is one of the reasons we don't have to grieve for our loved ones who've died like those who have no hope. It's because we'll see them again. And when we do, we'll be with them forever. Notice what he says in verse 18. He says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. You think about it. I mean, those are words of comfort, aren't they? You're going to be with all those who've gone before you who know the Lord. You'll be with them and you'll be with the Lord forever. And there'll be no more death. No more grief and no more sorrow. Good words of comfort, you know, but death's a fact of life, you know, because we live in a sin-cursed world, we're all going to die if we live long enough. That's what I always say. If you live long enough, you're going to die, right? Uh, but, but, and only those living when this event takes place will escape death. And when, when we lose loved ones, there's always grief. The relationship with Christ doesn't get rid of grief. It changes the way we grieve. There's going to be some sorrow because you know, we're going to miss them. We miss them. We, we want to see them. And, you know, the grief and, and sorrow, though, is much more intense when we know our loved ones who died don't know Christ. That makes it much more difficult. But though, for those who are his, there's... Just a great comfort to know that we will be with Jesus and we'll return with him and they will return with him when he returns and we'll all get these new bodies that'll never die. We'll always be with the Lord. That Great words of comfort. You know, sometimes just the right words, I think the Proverbs calls them like uh, uh, apples of gold. You know, words spoken at the right moment. And sometimes just Certain words at the right moment just bring great comfort. And, um, you know, every night before I went to bed as a child, my mom used to come in at some point and give me a kiss and say, I love you with all my heart. And those words somehow just always made getting through the night a lot easier, you know, less scary and much sweeter. And I don't know how old I was when she quit doing it, but. I remember doing it a lot most of the time when I was little, but they, they were just words of comfort, you know? And, and knowing that we'll be with Jesus and all of our loved ones who believe in him forever, and that promise of that, that those are words of great comfort, aren't they? And what makes the difference? It's belief. It's faith. Faith in Jesus makes the difference. If, if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins, and that he rose again from the dead, and you surrendered to him as Lord, you'll be saved. And, and if that's true, then you, my friend, have no reason to grieve like those who have no hope. You have a reason to look forward to the return of Jesus. He says, in Luke, uh, Luke's gospel, he writes, Then they will see, this is the words of Jesus, they will see the Son of Man, that's Jesus, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And he says, Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. When Jesus returns and you see him, it's about to happen, folks. You know, we may be at a loss for words a lot of times. We want to comfort people who are hurting. But, you know, just, say, just saying, hey, we'll see you again over there. That means a lot, doesn't it? 
That's the reason I think a lot of times when we say our goodbyes, we say, well, I'll see you later. It's not goodbye. I'm going to see you again. See you later. When we bury our loved ones who know Jesus, that's what we can say. See you later. See you later. You know, in the early Christians, they adopted this wonderful word for where they buried their loved ones. The Greek word koimaterion. That word means a rest house for strangers. That's what it means, koimaterion. And you may not be able to tell it, but that's where we get our word cemetery. That's where we get that word. So the same word was used in, in Jesus' day for inns, what we would call a hotel or a motel or an Airbnb, I guess, nowadays. But, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, when you visit a, an Airbnb or a hotel or a Ramada or whatever, then you go there to sleep for a while and then you get up and continue on your journey, don't you? That's the same picture the early church had for the place where they buried their loved ones. You don't weep when your friend spends a few nights at the Holiday Hilton, do you? <laughs> no, you're happy for them, right? You rejoice with them. And when the body of a believer has been put in the grave, it's the same thing as them being put in a motel for a few days until... Uh, uh, day of resurrection and and so that's the imagery and so you know i want you to understand one day the lord's coming and that body's going to be raised up from the grave and so you see if you're a believer who's placed your faith and trust in jesus atoning work and resurrection then there's no reason for grieving like those who have no hope there's no reason for you to fear uh, uh death and so we understand grief in belief is different because believers have a hope in a future resurrection. They have a promise of an imminent reunion. They have the comfort of an eternal relationship. I heard about an inscription on a gravestone in an old British cemetery not far from Windsor Castle. And it read like this. It said, pause, my friend, as you walk by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare, my friend, to follow me. Supposedly, one visitor came by and scratched these two lines underneath. To follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. Yeah. So I think that's the most critical question for everyone this morning is, which way... Are you going? What kind of grief will you have? Will it be grief and belief? You know? Uh, and so, you know, Romans chapter 10 says this. Pretty much what Paul writes in our text today. He says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. He says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So he's talking about belief, faith, that Jesus died on the cross for your sin, and that he rose again from the grave to show us that he's Lord, that he's Messiah, he's God, so that we can believe and follow him. And so maybe you need to make that decision this morning so you can have the hope that we all need in Jesus. So if you need to do that this morning, we invite you to come. You know, um, right now, I'm gonna bow, we're going to bow our heads. I'm going to pray. You're going to stand. And uh, whatever need you have this morning, we want to be here to greet you and to pray with you and to listen to you. And let's, let's pray together right now. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we thank you for your truth. God, help us to understand that death is different for believers. Lord, we have hope because of, of you. Lord, we, we have a future because of you. Lord, we have eternal life because of you. And so, Lord, let that be our message. Lord, let us live 
out that hope so others may know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together. Let's respond in faith right now. Come on. This is the 